My dear respected friends, history is an extremely important part of any human being's life. Because we as human beings, with our very nature of being insan and human being, we're not the first to come into this world. We as a generation have come after numerous generations. Many, many generations passed by before us. Maybe in terms of what we're dealing with outside, externally, in terms of the technology that we deal with, the advancements that we enjoy, and everything else that we indulge in that seems to be very unique, our mobile phones and just the whole fact that this is being recorded and then inshallah broadcasted for many more people to benefit inshallah. Maybe in that sense we're unique. But as an insan, we are not unique at all. Many, many insan, many humans passed before us. So we've got a lot to learn. And although the actual products that we're dealing with, the material products that we're dealing with, the technology, etc., maybe that's different. But in terms of the human emotions, we have the same emotions. We have a challenge to deal with greed. We have a challenge to deal with enmity, anger. The concepts of love, affection, emotion, all of these things are nothing new to us. They weren't invented. These are part and parcel of the human being, right from the first man until us, and they will continue. So we can learn a lot. So although external things may be a bit different, but we can still learn huge amounts from people of the past. And especially in terms of us being Muslim, and in terms of us living in this particular time, which seems to be a time of a bit of a low. It seems... It's okay. It's not, I mean, unless everybody else is feeling hot. I don't see anybody sweating, so it seems okay. When I see the sweat, I'll let you know. Right. So if you guys want that on, start sweating. We are at a time when it's a bit of a low, unfortunately. It's a bit of a challenge. Muslims, every day there's a smear campaign. Whenever in Ramadan, subhanAllah, Ramadan was so beautiful this year, it started off so beautifully. And then suddenly, within a few days into Ramadan, I, put, I wasn't looking at news, but I just happened to, the app opened on my phone. I pressed the button and three articles of bad news. Tunisia and I don't know, somewhere else and somewhere else. It's just extremely, extremely depressing. But, so what do we need? We need the stories of the past to keep us going during this time. Anybody who is a product of this time, and he only looks back 15-20 years, and just kind of gives a prognosis of what's going to happen in the next 10 years with all the depression that you see, then they feel extremely depressed. They feel despondent. They feel that there's no mercy anymore. Where are we going? Where are we going? This is how people feel. But if you go back before 20 years, if you go back few hundred years, if you go back a century, if you go back to the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and you read that history, and you read about the ebbs and flows, the highs and lows, the starts and stops, the pitfalls, and mashallah, the times of elevation, then you will see that this ummah has an ajeeb fortitude like no other. Any other ummah that has gone through what we have gone through, and what we are going through, it would not be able to survive. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given this ummah, this religion, an ajeeb resilience. That yes, it will go down, it will take a, a beating in a sense. But it has the ability to come back up. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses individuals in this regard. Because it's humans that make a change in this world. It's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses humans to make certain changes in this world. He gives tawfiq to certain beings. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enables certain people. He inspires certain people, certain groups, certain nations, and certain individuals. And this is how it is. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to bring somebody down, as mentioned in Surah Al-Isra, as well, He mentions the same thing. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that, أَمَرْنَا مُتْرَفِيهَا فَفَسَقُوا فِيهَا فَحَقَّ عَلَيْهَا الْقَوْلِ فَحَقَّ عَلَيْهَا الْقَوْلِ If we want to take uh, some area down, then all we need to do is, we just command the people of excess in those communities. And then they begin to commit fasad. And then after that, the decree comes upon them. And then they are seized. And then they are destroyed. So, 
it's humans at the end of the day. Humans have natural failings. So there's the ups and downs because of that. So today what we look at is we look at a quite a early period. A very early period. We look at the time of Hassan Basri rahmatullahi alayhi. He comes after Umar ibn Abdul Aziz. He comes around that time, just after Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, just after the turn of the century. Meaning that's when he becomes more famous. Though uh, what happens is Umar ibn Abdul Aziz was an anomaly. And he becomes the Khalifa despite the fact that he was not supposed to be in the line. But his predecessor, Sulaiman ibn Abdul Malik, was on his deathbed and his children were too young to be the next Khalif. So his advisor, Raja ibn Haywa, he, he whispered in his ear or he gave him some advice. He says, What about your cousin who is the governor of Medina Munawwara, Umar ibn Abdul Aziz? So he, he thought that was a good idea. So then he said, okay, fine, he's the next Khalif. So he became, becomes the next Khalif. And within two years and four months or so, he manages to make a massive change in the Ummah. He gives back all the confiscated lands and articles and commodities and everything that the Umayyads had been stealing from the people or confiscating from the people or taking from the people thinking it's theirs and using the Baytul Mal as they wanted. He gave all that away. And of course, he became hated within his own family ranks. His wife was the sister of many Khalifs. That this is the daughter of Abdul Malik ibn Marwan, Fatima bint Abdul Malik, her brothers Wali ibn Abdul Malik, Sulaiman ibn Abdul Malik, Hisham ibn Abdul Malik, and all of these. So she was royal. He was married into the royal family, and he was a cousin of theirs as well. But he even took, uh, he even had her take her ornaments and everything, and and give it, uh, and her jewelry and everything, and give it back. So now, the. The people who were at the greatest sense of loss were his extended family and his tribe. So it says that it was plotted against him and he was killed. After him, it goes back into the Umayyad line and it went back to as it was. After the death of Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, things went completely, the whole state policy reversed again to what it was, if not even worse. And they, Jahiliya returned essentially. Jahiliya returned. Yazid the second, he took full advantage of this situation. He took full advantage of this situation and he, he allowed his, whatever demands of his kinsfolk, his, his family members, they, he allowed them to go through. And likewise were his successors, was the same thing during the rest of the Umayyads. There wasn't much promise that was shown at this time. The pursuit of pleasure, it kind of replaced religion. Now you have to understand that whoever's at the top, generally the effect of theirs comes down to the bottom. There's a top-down effect. There's also a possibility of a, a, a low to, uh, to, to, to high effect as well. But generally the more powerful effect is up to down. So for example, it says that during the time of Walid ibn Abdul Malik, during his Khilafah, people were interested in architecture. So everybody was speaking about architecture and building and ornaments and adornments and beauty and all this kind of stuff. Because he is the one who is responsible for building the great uh, Jami al-Umawi in Damascus. May Allah protect it. And uh, Jerusalem, uh, Masjid al-Aqsa next door, there's the, the Marwan, all of that. He is responsible for a lot of the good architecture. The one that's very famous after him is Sulaiman, the magnificent uh, Ottoman. He is the one who is known for his architecture. But earlier on, it was Walid ibn Abdul Malik. When it was Sulaiman ibn Abdul Malik, his, he was more into indulgence. He was, a, he was a nicer person, but he was into more indulgence, everything like that. So that became... now. That became kind of the, the talk on the street and the trend. Uh, subhanallah. Today, the government is always talking about market economy and capitalism. So that's what we're all in it. And especially if you live in London, it's a massive craze for the property market. You know where it's going to go. Everybody wants a piece of it. And people who aren't in it, they feel depressed. That everybody else is in it and we're not in it. Everybody wants a piece of the pie. Right? And the lucky ones apparently are those who were here you know, many years ago and bought lots of uh, property on mortgage. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect, protect them. So khair, that's, these are just different challenges of the time that humans deal with in different places. So that's what became the pursuit of pleasure. Replaced religion. And the masses, their main pastime became opulence, indulgence, things of that nature. That became the big thing for them. 
There was a massive moral transformation from the time of Umar ibn Abdul Aziz. There was a massive moral transformation that took place, it degenerated. And again, Islam was seen to have gone to the edge, just as it had done before Umar ibn Abdul Aziz had come, uh, rahimahullah, to, to lead the people again. It seemed like, because when the, when the rule, uh, when the leaders become corrupt, then as I said, their influence comes down. Then what's going to stop the people from also becoming corrupt? So mashallah, in that time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always provides a savior. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always provides somebody. So, at that time, uh, you see the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa had foretold this period. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, because when he saw that many, much of the wealth uh, and the booty had come from Bahrain, and he saw that the Sahaba who were very hungry and in need at the time, became very excited about it. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam remarked about this, that I fear that a time will come when you will vie with each other, compete with each other after the pleasures of this world, the materialism of this world. And you will be destroyed like the people before you were destroyed. فَتَنَافَسُوهَا You will vie with each other about it. So this was a manifestation of that time. This hadith is in uh, Sahih Muslim, very famous hadith. However, it was through unflinching resolve of certain individuals within that time that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had inspired. They had a steadfast zeal, a very strong ambition, unflinching zeal in their sermons, their lectures, their teaching, their discourses that kept the ummah from degenerating into that situation and from acquiescing into that degenerated uh, state that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala used these individuals. These individuals at the time, the, the, the famous names of the time, there were many, but the more famous names of that time, maybe we'll be able to relate to some of them. Saeed ibn Jubair was one of them, rahimahullah. Muhammad ibn Sirin, he was not just somebody sitting at home or sitting in an office, uh, you know, uh, interpreting people's dreams. He was a mufassir, he was a muhaddith. He was a great scholar, a great faqih, and he was also a wa'id and a preacher and somebody who was worried about the spiritual degeneration, the spiritual uh, enhancement of the people rather. So there's Muhammad ibn Sirin, there was Imam Sha'bi, and of course there's Hassan Basri, rahmatullahi alayhi, Hassan ibn Yasar al-Basri. They're the ones who saved the people from acquiescing to an utterly agnostic, characterless, spiritually enfeebled existence. They're the ones who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala used to protect the ummah. And we cry to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the likes of these individuals. One of the main purposes of doing this series is one is to revel at our role models. Because when people have role models to revel at, it inspires them. It is not that, okay, they, these are people who came and who went. These are people who came and done their part. But what are we to do in that situation? The benefit of knowing about these people is that they act as role models. And in the absence of others, and today in fact when our role models are being replaced by other role models, other types of role models, then we need to know about these people. So we can say, yes, Islam has been glorified before. This is a forgotten history. This is the lost history. This is a crucial history that, that needs to be had today, that needs to be repeated and narrated today. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the tawfiq. He was born in 21 AH. So that's not too far, uh, not, that's not too distant, and not too much of a distant time after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa departed this world. And the most interesting thing is, his father was Yasar, who was an emancipated slave of Zayd ibn Thabit. One great uh, mufassir and great uh, writer of the Quran, Zayd ibn Thabit, rahimahullah. So his father was an emancipated uh, slave of his. And his mother used to work in the house of Umm Salama radiallahu anha. So for, for a number of years of his infancy, he was brought up by Umm Salama radiallahu anha. Because his mother was a slave for Umm Salama radiallahu anha, she would send her out to, on different chores, uh, different activities. And when Hassan Basri rahmatullahi alayhi, as a small child and an infant would, would become agitated, would uh, be in need of his mother, get hungry or whatever it was. Umm Salama radiallahu anha, uh, obviously a widow Umm Hatul, of the Umm Hatul Mu'mineen, she would offer him her breasts just for, that, for, to, for him to seek comfort from. So in that sense, 
you can see how much benefit he got from the household, the blessed household of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In fact, there's one statement about him in Hajjaj ibn Yusuf. Uh, there's, a no, uh, there's, a number of sim, there's a number of things about between him and uh, Hajjaj ibn Yusuf. But once, he was... Uh, Hajjaj ibn uh, Hassan Basri himself, he says that Hajjaj once said to, uh, said to me, Ma amaddaka ya Hassan? What is it that gives you your strength? You know, where's your energy from? Amaddak imdad. Imdad means madad. Imdad means assistance, help, energy. You know, so what keeps you alive? What gets you going? What is it that benefits you and gives you the strength that you have? Ma amaddaka ya Hassan? And he said, Sanatani min khilafati Umar. Sanatani min khilafati Umar. The two years that I spent with Umar in his time. Because this was uh, when he was being brought, uh, brought up. Umm Salama radiallahu anha, you know, she knew all the Sahaba, etc. So she would take him with her. So he would meet all of the Sahaba at that extremely important time. And he went, uh, she, he, she also took him to Umar, Umar radiallahu anha, Umar ibn al Khattab radiallahu anha. And he made a special dua for him. He said, Allahumma faqihu fi deen. Allahumma faqihu fi deen wa habibhu ilan nas. Now the first part of it is the same dua Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi gave to Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu. Umar radiallahu gave that dua to him. Oh Allah, faqihu fi deen. Give him a true understanding of the deen. And make him beloved to the people. And truly he was beloved. And many people, many of the Sufi chains today, they, they take their chain all the way back to Hassan Basri and they feel that's a great honor to do that. To Hassan Basri rahmatullahi alayhi. There's numerous things about Hassan Basri. He was an ajeeb individual. Believe me, and this is from experience I'm saying. If you look at the books of Tafsir, pick up Tafsir ibn Kathir, Tafsir uh, ibn Jarir ibn Tabari, or any of these great Tafsir that quote from the, the Salaf Salihin, and you will see, Qal al-Hassan, Qal al-Hassan, Hassan says, Hassan says, which Hassan is this? Hassan al-Basri. In fact, I think that in literature, Hassan al-Basri is more famous than Hassan ibn Ali radiallahu anhu. He's more well known. Doesn't make him superior to him. Hassan ibn, Hassan ibn Ali radiallahu anhu is a Sahabi. Hassan al Basri is a Tabi'i. So there's no comparison in that sense. But from a perspective of who's mentioned more, who's more famous in fact, there are many people who know Hassan Basri. He is the Hassan, Qal al Hassan. And believe me, you pick up the books of fiqh. The original fatawa books, it will be talking about Hassan al Basri. He has opinions in jurisprudence. And if you pick up the books of hadith, he will have opinions in, in hadith. If you pick up the books of, uh, of, uh, of uh, tasawwuf, and again you see the same thing. If you pick up the books of aqidah, he features prominently. Because when you have Wasil ibn Ata, the first progeny, uh, the, 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 the first, you can say, who's been responsible, they say, for starting the i'tizal, the whole group of Mu'tazilites, they say that Wasil. Because he used to attend the circles of Hassan Basri rahmatullahi alayhi. And there was one question that he posed. Hassan Basri rahmatullahi gave a specific answer. And about where people who commit major sins are going to be. And he said, or, or, or who, people who commit major sins, what is their state? He said, obviously they're kuffar. And he came up with the idea, this Wasil ibn Ata appears to have come up with the idea that any Muslim, who, uh, any believer who commits a major sin, he's no longer a believer. So is he a kafir? Said no, he's not a kafir either. He's somewhere in between the two, which is a ajib kind of hybrid uh, situation because w we say that even the biggest sinner is still a believer as long as he doesn't reject his belief. Yes, he's a big sinner. He's, he, is, uh, he, he can be punished. But he is still a sinner and a believer. Whereas they said, no, let's take him out of belief. But he's not a full kafir either. But he will be in hellfire somewhere. So this Wasil ibn Ata was in the circles of Hassan al-Basri rahmatullahi alayhi. Hassan al-Basri, ajeeb. I mean, one of those ajeeb, jami, comprehensive individuals. And that's why, if I for example take the opinion of uh, Zahabi. Imam Zahabi, he, 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 he mentions Imam Zahabi, uh, tells us who Imam Hassan Basri was. He says, كَانَ رَجُلًا تَامَّ الشَّكْلِ He was a person with complete form, perfectly form. Like he, he was a very beautiful individual, very handsome. تَامَّ الشَّكْلِ Beautiful features. مَلِيحَ Surah, Extremely beautiful in his, 
in his complexion and, and in his facial features. Bahiyan, shining. Shining individual of all that nur, taqwa, shining. وَكَانَ مِنَ الشُّجْعَانِ الْمَوْسُوفُونَ And yet, with all of that, he was also from among the most bravest of them. He was from among the most bravest of them. Shabi says, he was speaking to somebody and he said to him, إِذَا نَظَرْتَ إِلَىٰ, أج... إذا نظرت إلى رَجُلٍ أَجْمَلَ أَهْلِ البصرة. You're speaking to somebody who's going to go to Basra. He says, when you see a person who will seem like the most handsome man of Basra to you, وَأَهْيَبَهُمْ And yet with the greatest awe and dignity about him, فَهُوَ hasan He is Hassan Basri. فَقْرِئْهُ مِنِّي salam. Give him my salams. What a description. When you go to London, you're going to see this man who's like this, give him my salam. Subhanallah. He must have been so distinctive for him to have been given that description. That's why Mustafa Saeed uh, Al-Khin, one of the great scholars of Syria of recent times, he wrote a biography of Hassan Basri, he's a biographer of his. He says, فَهُوَ الْإِمَامُ فِي الْعَقِيدَةِ He was the Imam in Aqeedah. فَهُوَ الْإِمَامُ فِي التَّفْسِيرِ In Tafsir he's an Imam. In Hadith he's an Imam. In Fiqh he's an Imam. So he's not just, I know a bit from here, there, another. Like our ulama today, you know, we know a bit about everything and maybe a bit more about something else, hopefully. Right? No, he was a master in all of these subjects. Wa'idh. He was an Imam in Wa'idh. He was a Wa'idh, a preacher. He would make you cry by now. Subhanallah. Al Hikmah. In Hikmah, he was a master. His wisdom used to just roll off his tongue. Al Amir bil Ma'rufi wa Nahi anil Munkar. He was the commander to the to to the right, and he was the one who would prohibit from the evil. And at the same time, Al Mujahidu fi Sufuf al Jihad. He was also the warrior in the battle ranks. Al Khatib al Mufawwi fil fil Mahafil. He was also the great orator. Who was known, uh, you know, to 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 rise up. To, to rise up the gatherings. And that's, that's his great man that he speaks about. Jahid. Jahid is a one great Arabic literature scholar. He was known to be great for his writing. When he was, when he was asked, he mentioned, فَأَمَّا الْخِطَابِ When it comes to discourse, when it comes to lecturing, when it comes to giving a talk, a bayan, khitabat, فَإِنَّا لَا نَعْرِفُ أَحَدًا يَتَقَدَّمُ الْحَسَنَ الْبَصْرِيَّ فِيهَا We don't, when it comes to that subject, we don't, that field, we don't know anybody who can go beyond, advance beyond Hassan Basri in that subject. It says that Abu Amr al -Ala, ibn al-Ala, one of the Salaf Salihin, he, he mentions that مَا رَأَيْتُ أَفْصَحْ مِنْ حَسَنِ الْبَصْرِ وَمِنَ الْحَجَّاجِ ibn Yusuf I've never seen anybody more eloquent, more articulate in their speech more articulate in terms of the way the the roll the words roll off their tongue the choice of term the choice of words as you know as they say in urdu uske alfaz ke zero bam se right nashebo faraz se you know the, the, it's, uh, uh, urdu has an ajeeb but arabic is even more ajeeb and urdu takes from that arabic See, the, the, the great thing about Urdu literature is that it can take from the best of Hindi. It can take from the best of Urdu, uh, for, sorry, from Persian, from Farsi, and it can also take from the best of Arabic. And now, maybe to its detriment, it can also take from the best of English. Because it's a mixed up language, it's made up of all of these things. And if you really hear great Urdu, you will be inspired. Subhanallah, you will be inspired. If you see the great orators of the past like Abul Kalam Al Azad, Abul Kalam Azad, uh, Shorish Kashmiri, and uh, uh, what do you call it, um, Ataullah Shah Bukhari, Rahmatullahi Alayhi, you'll be amazed. They, they could speak from Fajr to, from Isha to Fajr and keep the crowd alive. You know? For, for us, we get tired in one hour. Their, their khitab was, was on a different level. Anyway, let's get back to our history. So, Abu. Amr ibn al-Ala says, I have not seen anybody more articulate and eloquent, fasi, effective in their speech, than Hassan Basri and Hajjaj ibn Yusuf. Amazing, Hajjaj ibn Yusuf was a tyrant, killed huge amounts of people, huge amounts of people, hundreds of thousands of people we're talking about. People who shudder. In fact, he could make a, a blind man see again. 
What do I mean by that? He couldn't do that. But he did it once. He went by this man who was making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, blind man who was making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Oh Allah, give me back my sight, give me back my sight. So he called him, he gave him a jerk, he gave him a push and he said, Do you know who I am? He says, No, who are you? I'm Hajjaj ibn Yusuf. I'm going to this place, when I come back by the evening, I'm going to ask you and if your sight hasn't come back, you're dead. And the person started making dua. Now he started making dua. When Hajjaj ibn Yusuf came back, the guy was seeing again. He says, this is exactly why I told you to do this. Your dua was nothing, your dua was fickle. This is our dua of today. We make dua Allah, help the ummah, help the ummah, change us, do this for us, do that for us. That's the dua. So when he knew he was going to die, he started making serious dua. May Allah give us tawfiq for that kind of dua. That makes a person who's blind see again. Subhanallah. That's Hajjaj ibn Yusuf for you. He had some good points. He had some very good points. So, despite that fact, when he would speak to his crowds, he could make them guilty for thinking bad about him. That's how eloquent he was. His speech was so sahirana, was so magical, that he could make you feel guilty that you even thought bad about him. He could justify what he's doing. That's how eloquent he was. A politician and a half. However, Abu Amr ibn al says, I've not seen anybody more effective in their speech than these two individuals, Hassan Basri and Hajjaj ibn Yusuf. Somebody then asked him, if you were to make a choice between the two, فَأَيُّهُمَا كَانَ أَفْصَحْ Which one of the two was more eloquent? And he said, Hassan Basri. Hassan Basri also had the heart that was doing its part as well. Hassan Basri knew it as well. He would say, my speeches do not lack anything. He would say, my speeches do not lack anything. But it's you people who are asleep. And today, in those days he said we're sleeping. Today we'd say people are dead, it's in, impossible to even wake them up. That's what some people have said. May Allah not make it like that. May Allah just keep it sleeping. And not dead completely. Because at least then we can be woken up. Ajib, ajib, individual. So he's brought up in this pure household with Umm Salama radiallahu anha. Now you could see the suhbah of the pious, the good company. That's why take your children to the pious people when they come. Get these pious individuals to put their hand over, you know, pass their hand over their head, make dua for them. These are the Prophet said, and why do I say pass the hand? It's not a cultural thing I'm speaking about. This is from the Sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam passed his hand over a child's head, and then after that, that child, you could smell him wherever he was. It was ajib. He didn't go around putting his hands on every single child's head necessarily, but this was one of the things that he did do. So that's why among the ulama, this is what they do when have a child come, they they pass their hand over their head, make dua for them put them in their company. All of this is of benefit. The benefit is through induction. We understand induction very well. You have an induction cooker, there's no heat there, you can't feel the heat. But the heat is being felt inside the pots. It's ajib. We live in ajib times that reveals many things for us. Now, when, as he grew up, he grew up with great character, great erudition, extreme intelligence. And Insight, spirituality, ajib, the soft heart, a powerful heart, and extreme prudence and wisdom. He excelled all the scholars of his time, the fuqaha of his time. People would turn to him for many answers, for many <coughs> solutions to problems. He was aware of the ills of the society. Because remember, he had seen the time of the glorious time of the Sahaba. He was born in 21 Hijri. And he died at an old age of 80 or 90, after the hundred, after the first century. So he had a huge amount of time and he saw everything. And he was a man of a heart who really understood things and analyzed things. And really understood the perspective behind things. He had some idea of how to bring the community back around. He gave certain solutions. Those who listened to his solutions obviously succeeded. And that's what kept the ummah from degenerating because of the, 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 the leadership. Celebrated orator, his people would be spellbound. 
the people who would be listening to him would be completely spellbound when they're listening to him. They wouldn't, they wouldn't be looking elsewhere. And when he spoke about the, his best speeches were about the hereafter, were about the past days of the Sahaba, the character, their character, and the, the days of the hereafter. It says that Rabi ibn Anas says that I stayed with him for approximately 10 years. And every meeting of ours, I would learn something new from him. You know, for 10 years you stay with somebody, you know all about them. How much are they going to say? Whatever they said, they'll say it in two years. They'll lose, you know, they'll, they'll finish off their supply. He says, no, for 10 years I continue to learn new things from him. Because once you get beyond a certain amount, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inspires you with great analysis, great understanding of things. And you're able to say many, many things. And th this is something that is not magic, it's not ajib, it's quite normal for people who are in the vocation. Sometimes you're teaching hadith and you're preparing and you don't understand something very clearly. It's happened so many times, you ask any of the hadith teachers, they go and they start teaching. And when you get to that path, suddenly you understand it better than you knew it before. And suddenly you're able to explain it in a way that you surprise yourself. Where did it come from? It's the barakah of that place, of being an inheritor of the Prophet ﷺ, of continuing that legacy. So if that happens to sinful people like us, then can you imagine what Hassan Basri was getting? Ilm al from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what inspiration he was receiving. It mentions that there's a consensus, Imam Ghazali mentions that there's a consensus of opinion that Imam, Ghazali, uh, Imam Hassan Basri's teachings and his con conduct reflected that of Rasulullah So he was in everything that he did, he, tr he was, it seemed like he was doing everything that Rasulullah would do, full uh, emulation of the sunnah of Rasulullah I'm going to, before we end, I'm going to just read out to you one of his sermons and give you the translation. It, it should take an entire lecture on its own right to go through the sermon in detail. But just to get, give you a flavor, I'll, I'll mention that. When he gave his sermons, because that's what he's most well known for and that's what's come down to us and that's the benefit that we get from him. His voice would become very forceful, sparkling with the fire in his heart and the sorrow that he felt of the degeneration of the Ummah. He used to criticize the changes quite openly. He didn't beat around the bush. He was very clear in what he said. And due to the eloquence of his sermons, his sermons today have found a part in Arabic literature. So if you are a student of Arabic literature of those Umayyad times, you'd have to read his pieces. And they are amazing. He would say after his sermons that they lack nothing. <coughs> for the utility of the people. But the people had just lost the warmth of their heart and that's why they weren't receiving it. How can you be so confident in making that statement? He was distinguished for his moral courage. He would speak out even against the Khalif of the time, Yazid ibn Abdul Malik. He even spoke out against Hajjaj ibn Yusuf. Probably one of the only people who spoke out against him and still got away with it. And Hajjaj was so, you can say, astonished by him that he asked him, where did you get this energy from? He says, I get it from the two years that I spent in the reign, the final reign, the final two years of Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu. Hajjaj ibn Yusuf, just to give, put it in perspective, 150,000 people had been put to their deaths by him. And 50,000 people were in prisons when he died. They were just left there to rot. The lightning success of the Umayyads army had conquered many lands. Because mashallah, after, during Muawiyah anhu's time, after we gained some peace after Ali anhu's time and all the turbulence during the end of Uthman anhu's time and the entire time of Ali anhu, and then after that you had all of these other problems. When it came to Muawiyah anhu's time, that's when the Ummah came back together again. 
And mashallah, they were conquest after conquest. Islam spread far and wide into the Roman, into the Roman lands and so on. So now what had happened is, people had come into the faith. People in those areas that come into the faith. I'll give you the perfect example for this. <coughs> Today, even if somebody hates a particular superpower like America for example, they still on an official level ally themselves to it. There's only benefit in doing that from a worldly perspective. Right? There's only benefit in doing that from a worldly perspective. Because you benefit from the dominant power. Islam had become the dominant power. So people had, whether it be convenience, they had brought the faith. But there weren't enough teachers to go around as they were in time of Rasulullah wasallam to go and really educate the people and take out their baggage, their culture, their previous religious uh, inclinations, ideology sometimes, and for them to come fully into the faith. So you can see what, what, what the issues were. So much of the elite at that time, they had adopted the ways of ignorance. They were engrossed in their self-indulgence, vanity, jealousy, lust for wealth. These are human failings. Even today you have them. Somebody can claim to be a Muslim, but a faith is only as good as the person who's following it. A faith is only as good as the person who's following it. For that person, it's only as good as you follow it. It could be the greatest faith in the world. If you don't follow it, it's not the greatest faith for you. Right? So, there's human weaknesses of greed, selfishness, and these are human failings. They come across the board wherever you go. They, they don't see religion or whatever. They, uh, a person would have to really get into his religion for them to eradicate his jealousy, his greed, discontentment, and so on and so forth. Although most people think that the hypocrites and the munafiqeen are restricted to the time of Rasulullah wasallam and those munafiqeen of Medina Munawwara, unfortunately that was not so with these people because they had come into the faith, they didn't know what it was to be a Muslim though. Today you have many, unfortunately our new generation is like this, in many parts of the world, where they are brought up in the house of a Muslim, but they haven't been taught, they haven't been to maktab, they haven't been to classes, and thus they know La ilaha illallah maybe, they know Friday, just about, and they know an Eid, you wear good clothes, and enjoy yourself, and they know that in wedding you wear all the red and gold and green, right? And uh, you know, you, you look kind of ghastly and all the rest of it. They know all those things, and that's what they think religion is. They think Indian culture, Pakistani culture, that's Islam. Because that's all that has been shown to them by their parents. Believe me, I've seen people like this. In America, I was their imam for eight years. There's many, many places that have not had an imam in their community or a scholar in there right from the beginning. So it's just a few enlightened doctors and engineers of the community that give the khutbah. And poor guys, they're trying their best. But what they're going to do if they've spent most of their time learning engineering or medicine, they're not going to have the same kind of Islamic knowledge as a scholar. Even a scholar who's not very intelligent but has just been through, he's still the barakah that he has is not there. Subhanallah. And this is a massive problem. Today we get so happy that a new brother becomes Muslim, a new sister becomes Muslim. And we say, Takbir la ilaha illallah. But Subhanallah, as many people are leaving, you'd be surprised. As many people who are doubtful, they don't even know whether they believe it or not. That's another case. This is the massive, the fitna of today is atheism. The fitna of today is atheism, is agnosticism. This is what the problems are of today. People don't know because of the way the dominant ideology that is propagate, propagated outside. So, Hassan Basri still believed that hypocrites existed in his time. He had the right to make this statement. We don't, generally. Somebody once asked him, do hypocrites still exist, the munafiqeen as in Medina, do they still exist? And you know what he said? If the hypocrites were to desert the streets of Basra, you'll find it hard to live in the city. What a blatant statement, what a bold statement. But not anybody can make that statement. You'd call them crazy if they made that statement. But that's what he said. He believed that peop a lot of people paid lip service to Islam. He didn't really, they did don't really let it enter their hearts. What so right he is. So right he is. And subhanAllah, even our pious people, I'll tell you how we don't allow it to enter our hearts. We do, but we could do much more. If I am to ask today, how many of us know Surah Al-Fatiha by heart? It's a dumb question. And please forgive me for it. 
How many of us know Surah Al-Fatiha by heart? Please raise your hands. Make sure you do, otherwise we'll have to start classes. How many of us know Surah Al-Fatiha, the, the translation of it? Now we don't have all the hands. And we have people who've been praying for 50 years first off. We have people who are dini, religious, everything. They don't know what they're reading in namaz. How can that Fatiha go in your heart if you don't know what you're saying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Allahumma bismika amutu wa ahya. Alhamdulillah alladhi ahyana ba'dama amatana wa ilayhi nushur. We know that dua but we don't know what it means. We get up and we say it like a spell. That's why ulama kehte hai ki hamari yahan duaye padhi jati hai mangi nahi jati hai. We read our duas, we recite them, we don't ask them. We have no meaning in them. The heart isn't in them. It's just baraka, tabarrukan we read it. To gain baraka from the words. They're good words. They're blessed words. The name of Allah, let's read them. That's why I would say, learn the Fatiha, learn the last 10 surahs of the Quran, understand what you read in your Salat, and you will see your Salat will have spirit. The Ruh will come into it. That's why I say that if this is the case with us, can you imagine, I mean, has our mind never gone to that side? So what about people who are not so religious? Where is Islam going to be compared to their heart? Aside from the fact that we have La ilaha illallah in our heart. And he would highlight the hypocritical traits of the ummah, that, that infested the ummah, that many wanted to keep hidden. He would bring it up. It was difficult for the sermons, the calls, the advices, the admonitions that he would give to be ignored by the society. When you got such a powerful heart, such powerful oration. One is you have a really powerful, pious individual, but their speech isn't as, pious, uh, as powerful. Sometimes you have people who are very good speakers, they don't have the heart, they don't do enough dhikr. Right? They, they, they don't have the taqwa, the same level. But when you got both of those together, can you imagine what this is going to be like? Ajeeb. It'll just... I've sat in, mashallah, with some shuyukh, and every lecture of theirs you sit in, you will cry. You just can't help yourself. Even I've seen people who didn't completely agree with the shaykh sitting in that gathering and crying. Because the words and the heart is so powerful. I've seen that today. And Hassan Basri must have been something else. I can just imagine. I can just imagine. Subhanallah. That's why society couldn't ignore these great things that were coming from this man and from others. They made, many people made solemn repentance to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They gave up their previous bad ways. He would prescribe certain measures, different measures to different people to eradicate their vices and to imbibe the true contents of the faith. This is one of the precursors of the, the Sufi tariqahs where they give the good ones, not the exotic uh, degenerated ones, but the ones that are serious on the sunnah. As uh, Mujadil al-Fithani says, when we have the futuhat madaniya why do we need the futuhat makkiyya With all respect for uh, Shaykh al-Akbar, with all respect. This is, I'm not going to explain it, this is for the people who know what we're speaking about. Futuhat madaniya you've got the ahadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa so he would prescribe measures, different things for different people. He spent a full 60 years of his life, full 60 years of his life, morally uplifting people. And it's, total, it's probably impossible to count and enumerate, to count and enumerate the number to, or estimate the number of people that were reformed in that time. You know, the hundreds of thousands, the millions of people that he was able to uh, he was able to... Now, if you read his stuff today, you still see the benefit in it. You still see the effect in it. Can you imagine listening to him, being a person of that language, it hitting your ear, beautifying your mind, embellishing your heart? Can you imagine getting the experience there and there? One is watching something on TV. One is actually reading a report about it. Then watching it on TV, watching it in cinema, and watching it in real life. I'm not encouraging anything, I'm just giving you an example. Right? These are examples, unfortunately, we can relate very well to today. Right? And Awam ibn Hawshab said that he truly did what the prophets do. This is what his mission was in this world. Hassan Basri rahmatullahi alayhi had earned, mashallah, the affection of everybody in Basra. Basra in those days was one of the greatest of the cities of the time. This is where Rabi'a al-Adawiyya al-Basriya came from. It produced such a great woman as well. This is Basra. 
Yes, it's known to be like a Birmingham of this time where you had many of the problematic uh, sects, it had all of that. But this was where Hassan Basri was dealing with. You can see how difficult his job was, right? He had earned everybody's affection due to his sincerity. So when he died in 110 Hijri, how old was he when he died? 89. 89? Subhanallah. What an age Allah gave him. What an age Allah gave him. Because you have the people like Nawi and Shafi who died before they were 50. And mashallah you have him 89 years old. Imam Ahmed was also, rahmatullahi was also very old when he passed away. Allah gave more benefits. The entire population of Basra came out to his funeral. And it was on a Friday. And for the first time of the history of Basra, for the first time in the history of Basra, the main masjid remained empty for Asr prayer. Because everybody was out at the funeral, they, they performed it there. His students after that continued to preach after him. And they continued to infuse the people. And that's why today you have many of the, uh, many of the lines of the Sov that go through. 22 years after his death, finally the Umayyad declined and the Abbasids rose to power. And the first of the Abbasid Khalifs was Saffar. He was the uncle of Abu Ja'far al-Mansur. And Abu Ja'far al-Mansur was the brains behind it. And he is the one who then consolidated the Abbasid Empire. And yes, they had their issues as well. But if you were to do a, a comparison in a sense, the Abbasids seem to have fared slightly better in terms of in, in terms of their rule. And yes, they had problems in there as well. You think, we have strange issues today? On, during the Abbasids, on one Eid prayer, the royal possession left after Fajr. Do you know what time they performed the Eid prayer? Before Dhuhr? After Dhuhr? Asr? After Maghrib? Now how messed up is that? We've seen it all. You think it's bad today? We've seen it all. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always brings it back. Always brings it back. Always brings it back. That's the resilience. That's the hope that I want to give through these lectures. That we've had bad times in the past. We've had very bad times in the past. But Allah always brings things back. We want to just hope that Allah makes us instrumental in that. How beautiful would that be? If Allah chose us or from our progeny, for there to be those who will save the Ummah insha'Allah and to be a savior. That's why one dua that is very powerful, that we should repeat as often as possible. Rabbana hablana min azwajina wa dhurriyatina qurrata a'yun wa ja'alna lil muttaqina imama. O our Lord, grant us from our spouses. So he said, neutral dua, wife can make it, husband can make it. Grant us from our spouses and our progeny, he doesn't say our children only, but our progeny until the day of judgment, those that will satisfy and gladden our eyes. And subhanAllah, what comes to mind is, we're not going to see our progeny, all of it, we're going to see maybe our children and grandchildren, maybe great-grandchildren, maybe great-great-grandchildren if you're very lucky. But what about the great-great-great-grandchildren? Inshallah, on the day of judgment, you will see your entire army of generation, and they will satisfy you if this dua is accepted. Everything that came, everybody that came from your loins, you will see them on the Day of Judgment. And I believe that this dua is transcendent beyond this world. It will also show its fruits in the hereafter, if Allah accepts it. That is a dua that should be repeated as often. It's a dua of the Qur'an, of a Prophet. And finally, I will read to you, um, I will read to you one of the, the khutbahs of Umar, uh, of Hassan Basri, rahmatullahi alayhi. He says, Hayhat, hayhat. If only you could understand Arabic. Believe me, these words, they create that, that desire in the heart. It makes the heart move. Hayhat, hayhat. Ahlaka nas al amani. Qawlum bila amal. Wa ma'rifatum bi ghayri sabr. Wa imanum bila yaqeen. Mali ara rijalan, wala ara uqulan, wa asma'u hasisan, wala ara anisan, dakhal al qawmu wallahi thumma kharaju, thumma wa arafu thumma ankaru, wa harramu thumma stahallu, innama deenu ahadikum lu'katun ala lisanih. Ida su'ila a mu'minun anta bi yawmi al-hisab, kala na'am wa kathibun, kathibun wa maliki yawmi al-deen. The power in those words. 
the boldness in those words, the penetrating insight. This is his analysis of the pulse of the Ummah. He says this, he says, such a regretful state, such a regretful state, hey hurt, hey hurt, dur ho, dur ho, in Urdu. Such a regretful state it is. The people have been destroyed by their own vain hopes. What is our life today? But upgrading our phones one year, upgrading our cars the next year, upgrading our clothing the year after that, if not in those both years. So every year it's just about what's next, what's next, what's the new thing, what's the new thing. He says, the people have been destroyed through their own vain hopes. They talk, they talk, but they don't act. They say the kalima, they say good things. The members are full of sermonizers who say good things, and may Allah not make us of them. But they say, say all of these great things, but they do not act. Knowledge is theirs, but without endurance. They have knowledge, they can't, they can't do sabr ala ta'a, sabr anil ma'asiyah. They can't have endurance in their practice. They don't have the sabr, they get misled. He says, faith they have, but no conviction. Iman they have, but no yaqeen. Then he says, Mali ara rijalan. Why is it that I see men, individuals, but I don't see minds. I don't see aql, I don't see minds. Look at the way he's saying this. And then he says, Why is it I hear lots of commotion? Asma'u hasisan, wala ara anisan. I hear a lot of commotion, but I don't see a single soul that is agreeable to the heart. Then he says, دَخَلَ الْقَوْمُ وَاللَّهِ ثُمَّ خَرَجُوا People only entered to come back out. They've only entered Islam just to come back out of the other door. They came in to show an excuse and then they went right back out. Then he says, وَعَرَفُوا ثُمَّ أَنْكَرُوا They acknowledge the truth, then they deny it suddenly by doing weird things, by doing strange things that doesn't seem like a Muslim would do that. And he says, they make things unlawful and then after that they make them lawful. Allahu Akbar. Isn't he saying everything that applies just so well to our situation? And he was saying this in those times. Can you imagine what he was seeing and what we're seeing? Subhanallah. And then he says, Your religion is nothing but a sensual delight on your tongue. It's just something that you use just to tell people I'm a believer. It's not gone into the heart. Lu'qatun ala lisani. It's just a morsel on your tongue. If you are asked, إِذَا سُئِلَ أَمُؤْمِنٌ أَنْتَ بِيَوْمِ الْحِسَابِ If you are asked, do you have faith in the day of judgment? You say yes. وَكَذِبٌ وَمَالِكِ يَوْمِ الدِّينَ كَذِبٌ وَمَالِكِ يَوْمِ الدِّينَ But no, lie, lie, it is not so. I swear by the Lord of the world, he says. This is a lie. Then he says, then he starts to describe what a believer should be like. And he says, Inna min akhlaqil mu'mini quwwatan fi deenin, wa hazman fi leenin, wa imanan fi yaqeen, wa ilman fi hilm, wa hilman bi ilm, wa kaysan fi rifqin, wa tajammulan fi faqatin, wa insafan fi istiqamatin, la yahifu ala man yabghud, wa la ya'thim fi musa'adati man yuhib, wa la yahmiz, wa la yahmiz, wa la yalmiz, wa la yalghu, wa la yalhu, wa la yal'ab, wa la yamshi bin namima, wa la yattabi' ma laysa lah, just beautiful you know aise alfaz ko is tarah piro rahe ke bas ajeeb it's just wonderful stringing of these words and yet none of this is superfluous he's not just doing it to create an alliteration or an onomatopoeic effect or some other kind of rhetorical effect no he's saying all of these words have substance so what he's saying it is only befitting that the akhlaq of a believer should be as follows that he be sound in faith a man of conviction his knowledge demands forbearance as moderation is an adornment for the learned he is wise the believer is wise but soft-hearted well-dressed and restrained well-dressed but restrained so he is well-dressed but he is not overly dressed 
right? You know, with all the gold and the silver, he is well dressed, but he is restrained, never wasteful. Even if a man, uh, even if he's a man of substance, he is charitable. You know, in our communities, when you become wealthy enough, do you know what the expression of wealth is in our community for our older folk? Does anybody know? It's a Rado watch. <laughs> when you got a Rado watch, it means you've made enough money now, like to buy a Rado watch. Hajj parliya, haji sab hoge. When with one somebody for Hajj, it was his first Hajj, but on the way he already had Haji Sab on his suitcase, mashallah. That's a tight, I mean, what else? I mean, you're not Molly Sab, you're not uh, Molbi Sab, you're not Hafa Sab, then you're Haji Sab, alhamdulillah. At least we have a zeal for gaining a religious laqab, a religious title. But the main thing is a rather watch. Alhamdulillah, enjoy it. Just don't get the big chunky ones, get the nice fine ones, they look better. Right? If you're gonna get a chunky watch, then get the, the Rolex. They're known for their chunk, not the Rado. What a bohat mingi, right? Uskiliya to bohat paper bill ne bringe. So never wasteful, even if a man of substance, he is charitable and compassionate to the destitute. He is large hearted and generous in giving to his kinsfolk their due. Land grab problems today plague our societies. Inheritance issues, who, which family is free of inheritance issues today? Subhanallah. Subhanallah. That's a massive problem we have. So he says, in giving the rights to their kinfolk, tireless and unflinching in rendering justice to others. He never crosses the prescribed limits in favoring his near and dear ones. Nor does he find fault or pick out the errors of those he dislikes. He doesn't, those he has a problem with, he doesn't go and try to unearth and investigate and pick out all of their bad points just to get a whole array of, you know, uh, fuel to use against them and weapons to use against them. A Muslim is indifferent to abuse. He is <clears throat> indifferent to abuse and taunting. He doesn't care about that. He ignores it. And if you uh, learn to ignore abuse and taunting, your life will be extremely happy. Because there's always going to be something or the other. So just ignore it. Just ignore it. And games and diversions, insults and backbiting. He ignores all of these things. He never runs after what is not his. Nor does he deny what he owes to others. Inheritance problems would be, would, would be gone if this was acted upon. And the final points he makes, وَلَا يَتَجَاوَزُ فِي الْعُذْرِ وَلَا يُشَمِّدْ بِالْفَجِيعَةِ إِنْ حَلَّتْ بِغَيْرِهِ وَلَا يَسُرُّ بِالْمَعْصِيَةِ إِنْ نَزَلَتْ بِسِوَاهِ الْمُؤْمِنُ فِي الصَّلَاةِ خَاشِئِ He never debases himself in seeking an, an apology, nor delights in the misfortune or misdeed of others. He doesn't get happy when he sees somebody else in misfortune. And then he says, a believer is humble and reverent in his salat. That's another characteristic of a believer. وَإِلَى الرُّكُوعِ سَارِئِ قَوْلُهُ شِفَاء وَصَبْرُهُ تُقَنْ سُكُوتُهُ فِكْرَةً نَظْرَتُهُ عِبْرَةً He says all of these things. He says his words, he's quick to bow, to, to bow down in front of Allah. When he speaks, they are, his words are a cure, not a problem. When he speaks, his words are a cure. His silence is for reflection. When he's silent, he's reflecting. He's not sitting idle. He sees to take heed. He looks at things to take heed. He seeks company of the learner to acquire knowledge. When he sits with them, it's not to argue with them or to taunt them and to whatever, to learn from them. He keeps silent among them to remain safe. He knows his place. And if he does speak, then he speaks to benefit. And then he says, يُخَارِتُ الْعُلَمَاءَ لِيَعْلَمْ وَيَسْكُتُ بَيْنَهُمْ لِيَسْلَمْ وَيَتَكَلَّمُ لِيَغْنَمْ إِنْ أَحْسَنَ إِسْتَبْشَرْ وَإِنْ أَسَاءَ إِسْتَغْفَرْ وَإِنْ عُتِبَ إِسْتَعْتَبْ وَإِنْ سُفِهَ عَلَيْهِ حَلُمْ وَإِنْ ظُلِمَ صَبَرْ وَإِنْ جِيرَ عَلَيْهِ عَدَلْ لَا يَتَعَوَّذْ بِغَيْرِ اللَّهِ وَلَا يَسْتَعِينُ إِلَّا بِاللَّهِ And he said, <coughs> he is pleased when he acts virtuously. He seeks forgiveness when he does wrong. When approached for something, when, when reproached for something, he stops, he desists. He is forbearing with those who act foolishly with him. He proves enduring when ill-treated. He does not abandon justice even when treated unfairly. He never seeks protection from anybody other than Allah. Never commits shirk. He is waqoorun fil mala, shakoorun fil khana, qani'un bil rizq, hamidun ala al-rakha, sabirun ala al-bala, injalasa ma'al ghafilin. 
كتب مع الذا من الذاكرين وإن جلس مع الذاكرين كتب من المستغفرين. Then he says he is dignified among a crowd. He is dignified among a crowd. He praises Allah when alone. His time alone is spent in dhikr of Allah. Content with his sustenance. Not complaining, I want more, I want more. Grateful for his prosperity. When he has prosperity, he is grateful. And res resigned when in distress. If he sits among the heedless, he is written by Allah among the ones engaged in dhikr. Everybody is heedless in that gathering, but he is being written as a dhakir. And if he sits among those who are in remembrance, then he is written as those who is seeking forgiveness. And then he said the final thing. He said, هَكَذَا كَانَ أَصْحَابُ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم. This is the way, this is how the companions of the Prophet ﷺ were. الأول فالأول. Every single one of them. One after the other. Hatta lahiku billahi azza wa jal. And this is how they were until they met with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wahakada kana al Muslimuna min salafikum as salih. And this is exactly how the believers from your pious predecessors were. This is exactly how they were. Wa innama ghayyira bikum lamma ghayyartum. And he tells us our reason for downfall. He says, Your state was changed. He doesn't say Allah changes that. He says your state was changed. Of course Allah changes it. But your state was changed when you made the change. You took the first step. You went in the wrong direction. You took the step in the wrong direction. And thus your state was changed. And then he said, he read the verse of the Quran, which I read in the beginning. إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُغَيِّرُ مَا بِقَوْمٍ حَتَّى يُغَيِّرُ مَا بِأَنفُسِهِمْ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't change a people until they make the change themselves first. We have to take the first step. We have to take the initiative first. Then Allah will bring the change. If you expect to sit back and let others do it, or let Allah just make the change and make dua for the change, make effort, do something more. Now you might say, okay, this is highly theoretical. What is the practical point from this, advice from this? I can give you one advice, which is just one. Do not remain stagnant. One of the biggest problems with the Ummah today, and I'll finish this off inshallah in the next two minutes. Inshallah. The biggest problem with the Ummah today is stagnation. If somebody has determined that the only salat they will make in the masjid is Jumu'ah prayer, then they will do this for the next foreseeable future. They have no plan to make any more. If somebody, mashallah, has the tawfiq to read one salat in the masjid, this is just an example. One example. If they have decided to make one salat in the masjid, they have no desire to make more. If a person has decided to dress in a particular way, which is not as Islamic, they have no, no intention whatsoever to maybe one day follow the sunnah of having a beard. They just don't have an intention in their heart. Stagnation. Yes, dua kar dena. That's the approach. No, you need to have the desire. I need to have the desire of what I want to do. That's why one great thing is every year, especially when it comes to Ramadan, make one change in our life, one improvement in our life, one enhancement in our life that we have not done before, and keep to that. And the next year make one more, and the year after that make one more. And I say only one, but it's not restricted to one. As soon as you remove the stagnation and the passiveness from your life, and this status quo of being unmovable, Right? Even water when it remains stagnant becomes dirty. That's what the ulama mentioned. Right? It's only through movement that you get somewhere. If it wasn't for movement, the pearls at the bottom of the ocean would never have been valuable. If it wasn't for movement, then the oud, the aloes wood, the beautiful perfume from the bark, which is the fungus of the tree, if it wasn't for movement, it would have remained stagnant there. It's by movement that you move, you move that you do something you enhance. Make a movement in your deen. We're making a lot of movement in our world, make a lot of movement in our deen, one movement a year at least. One improvement. And you will see inshaAllah that you will feel closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It'll be a remedy of life. Part of the solution of the ummah, everything, every individual done of this ummah has a bearing on the rest of the ummah. We take it down collectively speaking. So don't think that you're not part of the problem. Don't, I shouldn't think I'm not part of the problem. I am part of the problem. And I am also part of the solution. Let us make us, ourselves part of the solution. May Allah accept. May Allah accept. May Allah accept. Wa akhiru da'wana. And alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.